Well, good evening and happy Sabbath, though it's not Sabbath here yet. Sun setting pretty late. It's quite a change from when I was in Australia, where the sun was setting at five o'clock and uh, rising at 730. So here I'm sun's rising at rising at five o'clock and setting at 10. But it's nice to be back in Canada. So again, happy Sabbath, and uh, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for all the things that you do in our lives and for the blessings that we've had in this past week. And for me, it's quite a past week traveling back uh, here to Canada. And I know that you have protected all of us, preserved us. And we ask for your angels care and protection for our loved ones and that they can all receive a blessing on this Sabbath. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to teach us these things that we are going to study. that We can understand them fully and that we can apply the lessons that we learn to our lives personally and that we can be an influence uh, to those that we come in contact with. We pray for those searching for truth, those that watch these videos. And um, we ask, Lord, that um, that you can bless these videos as they go on YouTube and that you can reach those who are going to be receptive. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good evening, happy Sabbath again. My voice doesn't sound very good. It's probably just because I'm getting old or something like that, but it's a little hoarse. Could be because I just talk a lot, but that could be it. <clears throat> um, so anyway, we have uh, ML Andreessen. It's going to give us just a little biography on him. I remember him because I read his book, I think it's called The Sanctuary Service, if I remember correctly. It's a book on the sanctuary, and he also has a book on the book of Hebrews. And those are the first two books of his that I read. Christ in his sanctuary? No. That's right. It's nope. not Christ in the sanctuary. No, that's a different one. Ellen White has one called Christ in the sanctuary. I think this is called The Sanctuary. Yeah. Um, I do remember that. And the one on Hebrews is pretty good. And then he, and then I, I did read his letters to the churches uh, back in 1985. So, so I'm very familiar with this topic. Now, what we're studying is is basically dealing with the evangelical conferences, but we're looking at it from the perspective of Emma Andre Andreessen. Uh, his name is Elder Million, Million Lawrence Lawrence Andreessen. Um, he loved the historic beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. He dedicated his life to this work and over the years served in the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a pastor, public evangelist, and college teacher, dean, and president. In later years, he was appointed in the position field secretary of the General Conference, position of field secretary of the General Conference, which post he held for nine years. He was selected as the man to teach the first courses in what was to become the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. It was recognized uh, that he was the one qualified to begin this new project. And after retirement, continued in very active preaching and writing work for many years thereafter. Elder Andreessen combined the qualities of a teacher, theologian, administrator, and evangelist. And with these was added an unshakable confidence in historic Adventism, the spirit of prophecy, and the personal conviction that he must always stand true to what he knew to be right. Now, I know when he was a young minister, uh, uh, I think just out of school, he, uh, he spent a few months with Ellen White, I think about three months. Um, and he would visit her in the early morning, like five in the morning, and talk with her. And she gave him access to all of her writings. So um, so he would go and look through her her papers and 
he could see how she put together her writings and, and was rather surprised at how much she actually just wrote with her own hand. He expected that, you know, because of what he had heard is that her books were sort of stitched together um, from a bunch of things. But basically, she wrote The Desire of Ages out by hand and longhand. And all that was really done was um, some minor editing. So so the people who sort of teach that, you know, Ellen White copied everybody and, and they had to have these editors put together her work um, that isn't true. Um, I mean, she did read other people's books and use some of their language, which we all do to some degree, but she didn't steal their ideas and um, she didn't just copy. Um, but as well, you know, it wasn't just, you know, her writing some messy stuff and people actually making it into readable material. She wrote very readable material. So just the other thing that, you know, that he's a contributor to is, is this background regarding the spirit of prophecy. Um, now, the book Questions of Doctrine came out in 1957. So you can see that this is when M.L. Andreessen wrote this, these letters to the churches. Um, so he protested and in late in 1957. So Questions on Doctrine came out early in 1957. So... Um, this is in the form of six mimeographed studies. Later, these were gathered together by others and reprinted in a single booklet. The 69-page booklet was reprinted by Pilgrim's Rest, which is what we're reading here. So a mimeograph, uh, that was that one where you type it onto a, a special sheet and then you, you make copies. Is that what a mimeograph is? Remember they they had something. Was it that, was it that big? <clears throat> uh, it was like a steel drum, and they wrapped it around the drum, and then they spun yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah, and and it had this like, kind of alcohol in the paper and stuff that uh, I, I remember Carbon doing. Coffee kind of I, I got punished one time, and I was sent to the principal's office, and I had to uh, mimeograph uh, assignment sheets for one of the teachers or something uh, that, was, that was grade four. And we had one at, at uh, Warburg Church for years, but we finally convinced people to throw it out, you know, because it hadn't been in use for, for decades. But anyway, so that's how he would have put the book out. So he would have typed it on onto this sheet and you wrap it on a steel drum and then you print that page and then you do the next one. So, uh, Kind of interesting. But that's how things were done back in the old days. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, the incarnation was Christ exempt. So we're going to see some of these issues that we've been reading in A.T. Jones. Uh, we're going to see them here um, being brought out by Emma Andreasen. Now, uh, one of the things we know is that people like George R. Knight and others have labeled um, M.L. Andreessen with uh, LGT, Last Generation Theology. And, and this is supposed to be this great error that is a danger to Adventism, according to um, Dave and Daryl Bodwin, well, at least Dave Bodwin, and, uh, and, um, and uh, the the conference here in Alberta, the conference uh, treasurer, a friend of mine, um, who used to believe in last generation theology, but no longer do. They believe it's a, a great error. The idea that there's going to be this final generation that's going to reflect Christ's character to them is a great heresy. Um, the roots of that, of course, could we could trace them back quite a ways, um, all the way to Catholicism and maybe even to Greek philosophy. But within Adventism itself, uh, it really comes to the fore in this book, Questions on Doctrine. And it's, it's, it's wrapped in a nondescript uh, brown paper. That is, when it's being presented here in Questions on Doctrine, they're not highlighting 
what they're doing. They're, but they are doing it. So they're going to attack two different foundational doctrines to Adventism. The nature of Christ, that Christ had a sinful human nature, and also the idea that atonement is ongoing. In the book Questions on Doctrine, it's going to try to present subtly that Christ had a nature of Adam before Adam fell, and that atonement was completed at the cross. Those are the two points that Andreasen is going to address. But he's going to give us this background of what hap was happening at that time. And so it's very useful to hear his perspective. But he's mostly uh, giving us a study. So chapter one, the incarnation was Christ exempt. Uh, the word incarnation derives from two Latin words, incarnus, which means in flesh, or in the flesh. As a theological term, it denotes the taking on of the human form and nature by Jesus, conceived as of as the Son of God. In this sense, John uses the word when he says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This makes belief in the incarnation a test of discipleship, though doubtless more is meant than a mere belief in the historical appearance of Christ. Now, of course, he's referring to the Latin words incarnus. That's where we get our English word incarnation. Uh, but the Greek, uh, which is being quoted there in First John, um, refers to the flesh as sarx, uh, sigma, alpha, rho, and... Uh, uh, C, so S A R X, Sarx. And, and it refers to the fallen human nature, which he will address. Uh, the coming into the world, world of a new life, the birth of a babe, is in itself a miracle. Infinitely more so must be the incarnation of the very Son of God. It will ever remain a mystery beyond human comprehension. All man can do is accept it as part of the plan of redemption, which has been gradually revealed since the fall of man in the garden. Um, and this reminds me of something which is kind of unrelated to this study. Uh, but Ian, um, she's this black lady who is uh, uh, an atheist who became a Christian recently. And it just reminds me what he's saying here is um, because uh, she doesn't a debate, so to speak, with Richard Dawkins, who was her mentor and uh, explains how she's become a Christian. And uh, it's interesting that she says there are just some things you have to accept that because she believes that there is something where Richard Dawkins believes there is nothing. And so, you know, he says, how do you accept the virgin birth and all this kind of stuff? And she says, I don't base it on science. I base it on faith. I accept what the, what the Bible says. And, and often what we try to do is rationalize. And, and I didn't really realize how much as Christians, we try to defend what we believe on the ground of science, scientific presupposition. That is on the, on the basis that that science actually can answer uh, many things and things that really it's not designed to answer. We sometimes have to bow to science and we try to argue on that ground. And she does a very good job of not arguing on that ground at all, just arguing on the, the fact of faith. And I think of this in the context of the Trinity, what we call the Trinity doctrine, the triune, the Godhead, all this different. Uh, views that are floating around that nobody seems to understand, but wants everybody to believe what they believe in that. I've always just accepted what the Bible said without any explanation, but people, people have all these questions. And if you can't answer the question, somehow they, they got you, um, you know, but we, we know that we can trust what God's word says, even if we can't fully explain it. I like to put it this way. 
a um, couple of things that my answers are, <laughs> and and it, and it really does leave them without words. Is uh, it's like an ant trying to understand the reality of a human, or which is a kind of way of explaining how is a finite man able to understand the infinite God? If God is who we say he is, he's infinite, and, and he's outside of his creation, he is infinite. How can a finite ant understand that? It's impossible. And the other one was explaining my experience to my son, Josh. And I just told him why I believed in God you know, how my conversion experience and so on. And he, he just said, well, can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Ellen White's quite clear that there are lots of things that we have to take our shoes off of our feet, that they're, they're not for us to try to reason out because they, they don't matter in the sense of if we understand them completely, right? We can accept things by faith. You know, we can accept that Jesus is the very son of God, right? He's not an angel, right? Um, people might argue, you know, uh, for instance, uh, in in our, um, I think in our statement of beliefs, it says something there of the same substance. We don't even know what God is made out of. I mean, that's kind of a meaningless thing. What What does, are they made out of the same substance? We don't know. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? It's like we're, we're trying to define things that the Bible says nothing about. It doesn't say anything about Jesus' mm. substance, right? So to I have remember, a belief, I remember, I remember that I remember the silly questions that some theologian students would try to grapple with in school when I was at CUC, and one of them was, "How do the angels put on their robes over their wings?" I mean, it was, it was that silly the questions and you're right there's things we can't answer and questions we shouldn't ask even well, well hopefully they didn't we pass can. them in here. i'm hoping they well uh you weren't here i think when i was sharing about cuc and now they have well for years now when josh was there in, in the 20, 2020 or something no anyway when josh was there for a year yeah. those theology students went out to the welcome back CUC celebrations in the local bars. They have a welcome back CUC in Lacombe. In yeah, I have some bad stories, which I'm not going to tell. But anyway. Yeah, um, yeah we won't. But that's all. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and he goes on here, so Andreessen says, for reasons which we cannot fully fathom, God permitted sin. In doing so, however, he also provided a remedy. Uh, the remedy comprises the plan of redemption and is bound up with the incarnation, the death, and the resurrection of the Son of God. It cannot be conceived that God did not know what creation would cost him. And the Council of Peace, which decided the matter, must have concluded provisions for every foreseen contingency. Paul calls this plan God's wisdom in a mystery, even the wisdom that hath been hidden which God foreordained before the worlds unto our glory. First Corinthians 2, verse 7. One thing I like about uh, Andreasen is the really simple way in which he writes. I hope you all recognize it's, it's quite a straightforward way of writing. Uh, it's, it's quite a contrast from when we were reading A.T. Jones, because that paragraph that he has there, like six lines, uh, Jones probably would have taken six pages to explain that. The phrase before the worlds means before there was creation of any kind. Thus, the plan of salvation was not an afterthought. It was foreordained. Even when Lucifer sinned, the plan was not fully revealed, but was kept in silence through times eternal. Romans 18.25 For this, God gives no reason. Paul informs us that by revelation, he, God, made known unto me the mystery, the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons. Where, is, where did I go here? Where I got lost my spot here. Must have just flipped the page. Yeah, unknown unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3, verse 3 to 5. And then became. There are two words in the epistle to the Hebrews which are of interest in this connection. They are became in verse 10 of chapter 2 and behooved in verse 17 of the same chapter. So, of course, Hebrews chapter 2 deals with Jesus being man, fully man, just as Hebrews chapter 1 shows that Jesus is fully God. The Greek word for became is prepo and is defined as suitable, proper, fit, right, comely. Paul, who whom we believe to be the author of Hebrews, is very bold when he thus presumes to attribute motive to God and declares that it is fit and right for God to make Christ perfect through suffering, Hebrews 2, verse 10. He considers it comely of God to do this. That is, he approves of it. In judging God, he emulates Abraham, who is even bolder than Paul. Just understanding what God intended to do, Abraham counseled God not to do it. He said, "Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, but be not far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Genesis 18, 23 and 25. Moses also essayed to admonish God and instruct him. When Israel danced about the golden calf, God said to Moses, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them, Exodus 32.10. Moses attempted to pacify God and said, Lord, why dost thou, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people, Exodus 32.11 and 12. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people, verse 14. We readily see that in this interesting episode, God was merely testing Abraham and giving him an opportunity to plead for the people. But we also note that this illustrates God's willingness to talk over matters with his saints, yes, and with those who are not saints. His invitation to mankind is, come now and let us reason together, Isaiah 118. God is anxious to communicate with his people. Neither Abraham nor Moses was rebuked for his boldness. So this word behooved from the King James. The other word which we would call attention, uh, which we would call attention is behooved. Speaking of Christ, Paul says, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Hebrews, Hebrews 2, verse 17, while became, in verse 10, is a mild word, behooved, in verse 17, ophilo, ophilo, in Greek, is a strong word and is defined as under obligation, ought, must, should, bound, indebted, duty, owe. If Christ is to be a merciful and faithful high priest, Paul says, it behooves him in all things to be made like to his brethren, like made to be like his brethren. This is obligatory. It is a duty he owes and must not avoid. He cannot make reconciliation for man unless he takes his place with them and in all things becomes like them. It is not a question of choice. He should, he must, he ought to. He is under obligation to. He owes it. Unless he has to struggle with the same, t same temptations men do, he cannot sympathize with them. One who has never been hungry, who has never been weak and sick, who has never struggled with temptations, is unable fully to sympathize with those who are thus afflicted. For this reason, it is necessary for Christ in all things to become like his brethren. If he is to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, he must himself be compassed with infirmity. Hebrews 4 verse 50 and 5 verse 2. Therefore, if men are afflicted, he also must be afflicted 
in their affliction, Isaiah 83, verse 9. Christ himself testifies, I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting, Isaiah 50, verse 5 and 6. He himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, Matthew 8, verse 17. In nothing Christ spared, in nothing Christ spared himself. He did not ask to be exempt from any trial or suffering of man, and God did not exempt him. These experiences were all necessary if Christ was to be a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, he can sympathize with every child of humanity, for he knows hunger by actual experience and sickness and weakness and temptation and sorrow and affliction and pain and feeling forsaken of God and man. He has been tempted in all points like as we, we are yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. It is Christ's partaking of men's afflictions and weaknesses, which enables him to be the sympathizing savior that he is. Now, so, so what he's presented so far is very straightforward, right? We, we can see that, that Christ had to take upon himself our nature. Now, what some people would argue is that he took the nature of Adam before Adam fell. But I don't see how that's, that could be described in what's here. And um, so we're going to go on. If there's any comments, people can comment. But... Yeah. yeah, I got one. Okay. Um, when I think of, when I think of uh, someone spitting in my face, it's happened once or twice in my life. Yeah, me too. It, it, it caused, yeah, it causes so much things to rise up in me. And for Christ, for that to not face him, even on the cross. I, I was just shocked when I got spit in the face. It didn't, you know. It, I, it's I probably, an awful feeling. I, I probably deserved it too. But uh, that's a whole other story. It's <laughs> when I was a kid. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think, exactly, you know, but especially somebody that you care for, that would be more difficult, mm -hmm. right? Because God loves us, right? You know, the person who's dying for you being spat at, that would be more difficult in, in a certain sense. That warms. It's, not, it's not about you, That's it's about right. that other person. What? That awful warm, awful warm feeling of it dribbling down my face it's like what am i gonna do <laughs> okay <laughs> get careful there you know like um yeah we don't need the graphic i'm, I'm just comparing it to the strength of the temptation to rise back up in anger and that's what jesus yeah, but, didn't but, but i think the hard part for jesus is that he was dying for these people right i mean that makes it even worse because imagine if somebody that you really, really loved, uh, because it, it's and and they rejected you and they spit in your face, and they just show all this hatred towards you. I mean, that would be worse than just you know some guy you know that you had a fight with or something that you don't really care about. So well, it it, it reminds me like what you're describing there, someone that you care about, the experience of. Going through divorce was like that for me. I was feeling yeah. like I was being spit in my face. I didn't want it, but there was no other way around it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's how I felt. I can sympathize with that. Um, caring for someone and uh, them not having your motive, mo motives misinterpreted, motives yeah. misinterpreted, and yeah, yeah. Right, for sure. Because I mean. I really do care for people, you know, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, maybe I don't care for myself enough, but, uh, I'm always much more concerned with others than with my own feelings about things. But, um, and, you know, and I think of course, Christ would be even greater in that his love for us. So, 
So his temptation, we know, was much greater than the temptation that we had because Christ had the power to overcome sin in and of himself. But he chose, chose to overcome by faith in his father's righteousness, not in his own. So if you had, it'd be like, you know, uh, going through life and you have all this, these bills to pay and, you know, you're, you're going to be kicked out of your home or something. But you have a million dollars in your bank at the account that you can't use because you're, you're keeping it, you know, for tithe or something from before. And you, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's kind of how Christ's temptations were. He, he could have. It reminds me, uh, reminds me of some of these movie themes where, you know, millionaire goes, goes into hiding and praise himself as a homeless person to see who will care about him. So something like that. Love me for me, not for my money. Love me for G- being Jesus, not for being God. Yeah. 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 Okay. So was Christ exempt is the question. With these reflections in mind, we read with astonishment and perplexity, mingled with sorrow, the false statement in questions on doctrine on page 383. That Christ was exempt from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. To appreciate the import of this assertion, we need to define exempt and passions. The College Standard Dictionary defines exempt to free or excuse from some burdensome obligation, free, clear, or excuse from some restriction or burden. Webster's New World Dictionary College Edition defines exempt to take out, deliver, set free as from a rule which others must observe, excuse, release, freed from a rule, obligation, etc., which binds others. Excused, released, exemption implies a release from some obligation or legal requirement, especially when others are not so released. Now, one of the things, you know, when it comes to defining words, um, you know, most of the arguments that that people have, people use a lot of um, equivocation. That is where you use one definition of a word and then you switch it out for another, another definition of the word in order to uh, win the arguments or, uh, you know, present your position so that you're, you, people can't nail you down. And, of course, you only need to do that when you're not presenting the truth. If you're presenting the truth, you can be as clear as possible. You actually want to be as clear as possible in your definitions, and you don't want to use logical fallacy logical fallacies like equivocation. But one of the things that the book Question on Doctrines does and what Adventism has done is sort of switch definitions out when they seek, when it seeks, uh, um, serves their their end, right? Serves their argument. So now we look at passion. Passion is defined originally suffering or agony any of the emotions as hate, grief, love, fear, joy, the agony and sufferings of Jesus during the crucifixion or during the period following the Last Supper. Passion usually implies a strong emotion that has an overpowering or compelling effect. Passion is an inclusive word. While originally it has reference to sorrow, suffering, agony, it is not confined to these meanings, nor to passions of the flesh only, but includes all man's emotions, as mentioned above, as well as anger, sorrow, hunger, hunger, hunger. That should be, I think. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure. There's obviously a typo there. Uh, pity. It includes, in fact, all temptations that incite men to action. Now, that's actually an interesting um, definition: incite men to action. So. Uh, anger is, um, is, is an emotion that, that causes you to, calls you to action. And, and that's why there is appropriate anger, because there is time that we need to be called to action. So anger is not a, a negative emotion as such. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's an action emotion. Um, so that's what passion is. Passion is the things that, that call for action. Uh, to take these emotions away 
from a man, to exempt him from all temptation results in a creature less than a man, a kind of no man, a shadow man, a non-entity, which Markham calls a brother to the ox. Temptations are the character-building ingredients of life for good or ill as man reacts to them. So what we have to learn about these types of emotions is how to control them. And that's and control by not by control. I don't mean repress how to recognize them and act in accordance with God's law. When these emotions come upon us. Bring it into the control of conscious conscience and reason. Yes. So because they can often be uncontrolled emotion. Because even though these are, are to call to action, some people have uncontrolled emotion that is. They can't control their emotions. They can't direct them. So, you know, if they get angry, you know, they end up hurting someone, sometimes killing someone, like Cain when he killed Abel. Uh, His emotions got the better of him. His passions controlled him. We all have these emotions. It's Having them is not wrong. It's what we do in our actions because of these emotions. So that's why they build character. If Christ was exempt from the passions of mankind, he was different from other men, none of whom is so exempt. Such teaching is tragic and completely contrary to what the Seventh-day Adventists have always taught and believed. Christ came as a man among men, asking no favors and receiving no special consideration. According to the terms of the covenant, he was not to receive any help from God, not available to any other man. This was a necessary condition if his demonstration was to be of any value and his work acceptable. The least deviation from this rule would invalidate the experiment, nullify the agreement, void the covenant, and effectively destroy all hope for man. Satan's contention has always been that God is unjust in requiring men to keep the law and doubly unjust in punishing them for not doing what cannot be done when what no one has ever done. His claim is that God ought to at least make a demonstration to show that it can be done and done under the same conditions to which men are subject. Noah, Job, Abraham, David, all very good, were, were good men, but all failed to come up to God's high standard. All men have sinned, says Paul, Romans 3.23. God was not moved by Satan's challenge. Uh, For long before, even from eternity, God had decided upon his course of action. Accordingly, when the time came, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, because of sin, and condemned sin in the flesh, Romans 8.3. Christ did not condone sin in the flesh. He condemned it and in so doing upheld the power and authority of the law. By dying on the cross, he further enforced the law by paying the penalty required for its transgression and upheld the affliction of its penalty by paying its demand. He was now in position to forgive without being accused of ignoring the law or setting it aside. When it became evident that God intended to send his son and in him demonstrate that man can keep the law, Satan knew that this would constitute the crisis and that he must overcome Christ or perish. One thing greatly concerned him. Would Christ come to this earth as a man with the limitations, weaknesses, and infirmities which men had brought upon themselves because of excesses? If so, Satan believed he might overcome him. If God should exempt him from the passions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam, he could claim that God played favorites and the test was invalid. In the following quotations, we have God's answer. God permitted his son to come, a helpless babe, subject to the weakness of humanity. He permitted him to meet life's perils in common with every human soul, to fight the battle as every child of humanity must fight it at the risk of failure and eternal loss. Desire of Ages, page 49. Many claim it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. 
Our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. The temptations to which Christ was subject were a terrible reality. As a free agent, he was placed on probation with liberty to yield to Satan's temptations and work at cross purposes with God. If this were not so, if it had not been possible for him to fall, he could not have been tempted in all points as the human family is tempted. That's from Youth Instructor, October 28, 1899. When Adam was assailed by the tempter, none of the effects of sin were upon him. He stood in the strength of perfect manhood, possessing the full vigor of mind and body. It was not thus with Jesus when he entered in the wilderness to cope with Satan. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in physical strength and mental power and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue man from the lowest depth of his degradation. Desire of Ages. Uh, 117. Christ vanquished Satan in the same nature over which Satan obtained the victory. The enemy was overcome by Christ in his human nature. The power of the Savior's Godhead was hidden. He overcame in human nature, relying upon God for power. This is the privilege of all. That's from the youth instructor, April 25th, 1901. Letters have been coming into me. Affirming that Christ could not have the same nature as man, for if he had, he would have fallen under simple, similar temptations. And if he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. If he was not a partaker of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man has been. And if it were not possible for him to yield to temptations, he could not be our helper. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battle as man, in man's behalf. His temptation and victory tell us that humanity must copy the pattern. Men must become a partaker of the divine nature. Review and Herald, February 18, 1890. Christ bore the sins and infirmities of the race as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. He took human nature and bore the infirmities of the degenerate race. The temptations of Christ, page 30 and 31. If Christ had been exempt from passions, he would have been unable to understand or help mankind. It, therefore, behooved him in all things to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, or in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. He is able to succor or to help them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 18. A savior who has never been tempted, never has to battle with passions, and has never offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him who was able to save him from death, who, though he were a son, never learned obedience by the things he he suffered, but was exempt from the very things that a true savior must experience. Such a savior is what this new theology offers us. It is not the kind of savior I need, nor the world. One who has never struggled with passions can have no understanding of their power, nor has he ever had the joy of overcoming them. If God extended special favors, and exemptions to Christ. In that very act, he disqualified him for his work. There can be no heresy more harmful than that here he disqualified, that here, uh, more harmful than that here discussed. It's, I'm not sure if there's a typo there. It says, if taken away the Savior, it, it would be, it has taken away the Savior. It, I have known and substitutes him for a weak personality. So be more, it takes, it takes away the Savior I have known. That would make more sense. And substitutes him for a weak personality, not considered by God capable of resisting and conquering the passions, which he asks men to overcome. It is, of course, 
patent to all, that no one can claim to believe the testimonies and also believe the new theology that Christ was exempt from human passions. It is one thing or the other. The denomination is now called upon to decide. To accept the teachings of question on doctrine necessitates giving up faith in the gift God has given to his people. It may, uh, so he's going to give us some history. It may interest the reader to know how these new doctrines came to be accepted by the leaders and how they came to be included in questions on doctrine and thus receive official standing. The question of the nature of Christ, one in the flesh, is one of the foundation pillars of Christianity. And this doctrine hangs the salvation of men. The Apostle John makes it a deciding factor by saying every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. First John 4, verse 2 and 3. In what kind of flesh did Jesus come to this earth? We repeat a quotation which we have given above. Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus... Could he rescue man from the lowest depth of his degradation? Desire Ages, page 117. Only as Christ placed himself on the level of the humanity he had come to save, could he demonstrate to men how to overcome their infirmities and passions. If the men with whom he associated had understood that he was exempt from the passions with which they had to battle, his influence would immediately have been destroyed and he would be reckoned a deceiver. His pronouncement, I have overcome the world, John 16, 33, would be accepted as a dishonest boast. For without passions, he had nothing to overcome. His promise that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my father in his throne, Revelation 3, 21, would be met by the claim that if God would exempt them from passions, they also could do what Christ had done. That God exempted Christ from the passions that, meant that corrupt men is the same as the acme of all heresy. It is destruction of all true religion and completely nullifies the plan of redemption and makes God a deceiver and Christ his accomplice. Mm -hmm. Great responsibility rests upon those who teach such false doctrine to the destruction of souls. The truth, of course, is that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, Romans 8.32. Rather, because his nature was sensitive to the least slight or, or disrespect or contempt, his tests were harder and his temptation stronger than any we have to endure. He resisted even unto blood. No, God did not spare or exempt him. In his agony, he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Hebrews 5 verse 7. He were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered in verse 8. In view of all this, we repeat the question, how did this God dishonoring doctrine find its way into the, this denomination? Was it the result of close and prayerful study by competent men over a series of years? And were the final conclusions submitted to the denomination in public representative, representative meetings, advertised beforehand in the review, giving the details of what changes were contemplated as the denomination has voted in the, uh, it, as the proper procedure? None of these things were done. An anonymous book appeared, the men were judged, and the brakes tightened on anyone who objected. Here's the story of how these new doctrines found their way into the denomination, as reported by Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, editor of the religious journal Eternity, in September 1956, issue of his magazine, later issued as a copyrighted article entitled, Are Seventh-day Adventist Christians? With permission, we quote from this article, and we may inject that Dr. Barnhouse advises us that the entire content of the article was submitted to the Adventist brethren for approval before publication. The fact that this report has been in print for nearly three years and no correction or protest has been forthcoming from our leaders 
would strongly argue that they accept the truthfulness of the account. Dr. Barnhouse reports that a little less than two years ago, I was it was decided that Mr. Martin, that's Walter Martin, uh, should undertake research in connection with Seventh-day Adventism. Mr. Walter R. Martin was at that time a candidate for degree of Doctor of Philosophy in New York University and also connected with the editorial staff of Eternity. Wishing to get firsthand and reliable information, Mr. Martin went to Washington to the Adventist headquarters where he got in touch with some of the leaders. The response was immediate and enthusiastic. Mr. Martin immediately perceived that the Adventists were strenuously denying certain doctrinal positions, which he had been previous, which had been previously attributed to him. Chief among these were the question of the mark of the beast and the nature of Christ while in the flesh. Mr. Martin pointed out to them that in their bookstore adjoining the building in which these meetings were taking place, a certain volume published by them and written by one of their ministers categorically stated the contrary to what they were now asserting. The leaders sent for the book, discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, and immediately brought this fact to the attention of the general conference officers, that, this, that the situation might be remedied and such publications be corrected. Yes. This concerned particularly the doctrine of the mark of the beast, one of the fundamental doctrines of the Adventist church held from near its beginning. When the leaders discovered that Mr. Martin was correct, they suggested to the officers that the situation be remedied in such publications corrected. This was done. We're not informed which publications were so remedied and corrected, nor if the authors were notified before the changes were made, nor if the duly appointed book committee was consulted, nor if the book editors or the publishing houses were agreeable to the changes. We do know, however, that in the Sabbath school lessons for the second quarter of 1958, which dealt with the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, the 13th chapter, which discusses the mark of the beast, was entirely omitted. Chapter 12 was there, so was chapter 14. But there was no chapter 13. The Sabbath school lessons had evidently been remedied and corrected. Now, of course, um, you know, you can think back, you know, we, we now have the Internet and we've been used to what's happening in the church. But for many Adventists back in the 1950s, the idea that the church would be uh, promoting something that would be error, that this book questions on doctrine uh, would have error, was quite shocking. You know, it had been some years before uh, that... Uh, Kelly has a note there. Uh, where was my train of thought there? That wrecked my train of thought. Yeah, so we, we've, so, yeah, so sometime before, I mean, they had gone through the issue dealing with uh, the shepherd's rod. And, you know, and the church seemed to be on the right side of things. But this, this had been growing for a long time within the, uh, the scholarship of Adventism. And it took quite a while for the uh, the public to really understand what was happening. Uh, even though we think this is 1957, I don't think it was really fully generally understood until the 1980s. Okay, so we go on the same procedure. Oh, I need to read this uh, paragraph about it. It is certainly anomalous when a minister of another denomination has enough influence with our leaders to have them correct our theology affect a change in the teaching of the denomination on the most vital doctrine of the church and even invade the Sabbath schools of the world and withhold from them the important lessons of Revelation 13. For our leaders to accept this is tantamount to abdication of their leadership. Okay, so um, there's a comment here. Okay. I, when, when, you, when you read about Christ's Sweat yeah. and blood. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I used to read that. I used to read that as uh, like an analogy or something. It wasn't really happening. It was just so a way to describe how powerful it was that he was going through. But that's how I read it. Until I was sitting in uh, grade 12 biology class. And uh, she was explaining how the cells work and fluids are exchanged within 
and all of that. And then I paused. I looked at her. I says, "You mean we we could actually sweat blood?" Speaking through both human anatomy, yeah. Mm -hmm. And looking into it further, the, these are some of the things I found. And, yeah. Uh, okay. So Jesus did sweat blood. Sweat blood. And it's only a few occurrences in history that have been recorded. And one of them, it, it's when people are under extreme stress is one. Uh, and an example of some nuns were captured and abused and they sweat blood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there. One is because I'm really tired at this time change. It doesn't make any sense why I'm tired now. Um, because this would be sad. Wouldn't be a. <laughs> would it be a problem on a flat Earth? <laughs> kind of a serious yeah, question. I'm in a different I time know. zone. I don't know if that has anything to do with flat Earth or round Earth, but. Um, okay. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's. It takes a while to get off jet lag. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to get back into a regular sleeping schedule, I just didn't sleep well last night. Trying to, you know, just go to bed and wake up the usual times that I did before. But anyway, we're going to stop there. But you can see we're starting looking at this history. And I've, I've made mention of this history before. Right. In regard to uh, the evangelical conferences. But obviously, uh, Emma Andreessen knows a bit more about those than than we do and that he was there at the time, not in the conferences, but knows what was happening. And of course, I've mentioned many times that the first book that I read after I became an Adventist was Seventh-day Adventist. Um, what is it? Uh, the Puzzle of Seventh-day Adventism by a book, Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin. And uh, so I knew shortly after I became an Adventist about this issue of what, what had happened in the 1950s. So, so it's something that we're still dealing with. We're, we're still dealing with the aftermath of this situation in, in the church, and that's why the church is in the shape that it's in. The seed was planted there that has grown, uh, blossomed, and bore fruit. And uh, it's not pretty. Okay, any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath and we pray for the studies tomorrow and the Sabbath school and the sermon. Dwight's studies and mine. Uh, we're going to look at the symbolic use of numbers and understand, Lord, that all of these truths that we study are in relation to, to your salvation for us. They speak to us. And they encourage us. I pray that you can bless each one. You can again watch over our loved ones, that your angels' presence uh, can keep them safe and that your Holy Spirit can speak to their heart. We thank you for all things. We thank you for the Sabbath. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>